So today we have a few bits of Star Wars news, and there is a central question to the two main stories. Is Lucasfilm making a mistake villainizing the Jedi as much as they are? The Jedi Council was certainly flawed, but it seems like with a lot of content right now, they're being made to be the villains of the galaxy, some claiming they were worse than the Sith. Now when it comes to the arguments about being taken from their homes at a young age, if you want to talk about blind obedience and religiosity, something Qui-Gon Jinn warned against, then I see that point of view. But in the upcoming show The Acolyte, the stars of the series recently confirmed they are going to be the villains of the show. The series is going to expose a lot of their problems, but also make the point they were the real villains. Considering it's from the point of view of the dark side, this does make a lot of sense, but could they go too far with it? So just for a quick second, let's analyse this question. Was the Jedi Order evil? Well, of course, from a certain point of view. As Star Wars fans just watching the films, especially 1-3 to and The Clone Wars, and a little bit of Tales of the Jedi, some of the Jedi Order were aware of the problems. Qui-Gon Jinn, Ahsoka, Barisofi before she turned to the dark side, Yaddle, which gave us some great insight when she spoke to Count Dooku and acknowledged there was a problem. There was corruption in the Republic. What was meant to be an order of four sensitive individuals keeping the peace had become an army, no longer self-disciplined or aware of the darkness rising beneath them. A bit of arrogance as well. I mean, we often talk about Anakin, how the fact one of the reasons he turned to the dark side is that the Jedi Council provided him no useful help when he was experiencing sadness, when he was having visions and dreams of his mother dying, and then Padme. They just told him to let go. He was told to be mindful of his feelings instead of addressing them, which is why I think Qui-Gon Jinn was one of the best of the Order, and those like Mace Windu and Yoda were very flawed in their thinking. They were so attached to their teachings as Jedi, instead of the pure will of the Force. Their code discouraged personal connections and emotions, and there were several outside of Anakin who had emotional detachment and internal conflicts. Additionally, as the prequel trilogy unfolded, some of them struggled to navigate the complexities of the war, and they were drawn into the political machinations of the Republic and all was going on, but they were being played from both sides, both the Separatists and the Republic, Palpatine the Orchestrator. So with the Acolyte exploring very similar things much earlier in the timeline, there is no Clone Wars just yet, there is no Palpatine just yet, what is that going to be like? What kind of problems exist within the Order? Are the Jedi evil? It's an intriguing question, because each individual Jedi member will have their own point of view of the Jedi religion and the Jedi Order itself, based on their master, based on the way they were taught, based on their own experiences. Someone like Depa Balaba, who was Kanan Jarrus's master, and the apprentice of Mace Windu, understood what struggling was. Before she died during Order 66 on Kalar, as we see in The Bad Batch Season 1, she suffered horrific injuries during the Battle of Harun Kal. Things like that make you question, what are you fighting for anymore? Not necessarily in her case, but many Jedi would question their own order and what it stands for anymore. And speaking of villainizing the Jedi, they were originally going to do the same thing in the Kenobi show before other writers came on board. This seems to happen with a lot of Star Wars shows. After the fact, whether it's months later or in this case a year later, we as fans hear about alternate versions, deleted scenes, and missed opportunities that were changed. In the case of Kenobi, it's a bit more complicated because, as we've covered before, this wasn't originally going to be a Disney Plus show. It was going to be a movie trilogy with different people working on it, different writers. It wasn't going to be Deborah Chow and Joby Harold. But now one of the original writers, Stuart Beatty, has shared some more information about his version of the story. This was the version that focused on Luke instead of young Leia, and there was going to be Commander Cody. This version was very different, but there were still going to be Inquisitors, and there was still going to be Reva. In his version, Reva did not survive her duel with Darth Vader, and she didn't know he was Anakin, so the premise of her character was very different, because in the final version that we got, Reva was a survivor of Order 66, who was literally stabbed by Anakin, and she used her anger and revenge to survive. This puzzled a lot of fans when we saw that flashback. But in Stuart Beatty's version, while she did survive the Great Jedi Purge as well, she didn't realise that Anakin was Darth Vader. In his own words, he says, I was like, how'd she know that? All she saw was Anakin as Anakin. In her mind, the Jedi Council were the biggest villains in the galaxy. I think they could have done Reva so much better than what they did. The dialogue was strange. I will say her redemption was done well, but her story up until that point had a lot of inconsistency. They didn't give her a lot of the intrigue and mystique that a lot of Inquisitors are afforded. Even the new book, Rise of the Red Blade, understands the fundamentals of how to craft a good Inquisitor. 
and they should have given her a helmet. It would have made her so much more ominous. Just look at the seventh sister from Star Wars Rebels, or the eighth brother, or the Inquisitor we're about to see in the Ahsoka show, and you could have had her remove her helmet for those emotional scenes where she reveals her backstory. Maybe in that scene where she talks to Obi-Wan behind that door. Now with Stuart Beatty, it's interesting, because they didn't throw all of his ideas out. I suppose some fans might take issue with the way he characterizes the Jedi Council, calling them the biggest villains. It goes back to the question, is Disney Star Wars villainizing the Jedi too much? Or is it warranted? The Acolyte is about to do the same thing. In other Star Wars news, Rosario Dawson brought up the Ahsoka show when talking about Haunted Mansion with The Hollywood Reporter. She revealed that just like for every show Dave does, he did pre-animations for the entirety of every episode of the Ahsoka show, but he didn't let anyone watch them, so no one's seen them just yet. Could these feature in the behind the scenes when the Disney gallery eventually comes out? And she also describes the show as a work of art. Warwick Davis, an absolute legend of cinema, an absolute legend in the Star Wars franchise as well, in speaking with Slash Film has revealed his dream Star Wars spin-off. If he could choose any show to be involved in, what would it be? And surprisingly, it doesn't involve Ewoks. That's right, it's one of his other characters. While at first he says Warwick, he thinks outside the box and comes to the conclusion that his character from Rogue One, Weetief C.U.B. deserves his own show. He is a terrifying and very dangerous expert in explosives, from the species Talpini and part of Saw Gerrera's faction of partisans. And Warwick Davis, who of course is also Willow, asks a very good question. What happened to Weetief? What happened to him? So moving on to our next subject, I came across a very interesting opinion piece that Star Wars projects are complemented and made better by the comics, or at least those projects which have comics which tie into it. And with a lot of these, I just so happen to agree, and I want to give you some examples of where this works. If we talk about Battlefront 2, this game was widely popular, but it featured an unexpected solo campaign, which put players in the heart of an Imperial kill team known as Inferno Squad. Now you might be aware of that name, especially if you're familiar with Aiden Verzio, but not everyone knew her backstory. We knew that she defected, she became disillusioned with the Empire, but in some ways not enough. Now featuring some of the deadliest bounty hunters in the galaxy, including Bosk, the Bounty Hunters comic has included Versio and the Inferno Squad, who are tracking down their titular leads. The comic surprisingly provides a fantastic look at the teamwork of the squad and also some well-warranted action, elevating the story in Battlefront 2. Another great example which I've spoken about on the channel is what I like to call the Kira Trilogy. It started with War of the Bounty Hunters, taking place between the events of Episodes 5 and 6. And what an amazing trilogy it is. And if you called the video where I talked about the ending of that trilogy, I think it sets up something very interesting for future Mandoverse shows. Kira's not done. Solo A Star Wars Story did a lot for the character, and fans have wanted to see Amelia Clarke return to the franchise, or at least, some fans, because Solo has built up quite the cult following. But I've got to admit, out of all of the Disney Star Wars comics, this trilogy is one of the best. Another great example is Black Crescenton in the Book of Boba Fett. He was an icon of Star Wars comics beforehand, one of the biggest, baddest Wookiee bounty hunters. He worked with Boba Fett, he had run-ins with Jabba the Hutt, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I do think the show did him justice. In my opinion, Kersantan was portrayed really well. He did not hold back. The way he ripped off the arms of Trandoshans really shows his badassery, and it's complimented if you go back and read the comics. Kersantan, or Santo for short as he's often nicknamed, originally appeared in the Dark Vader comic run before appearing alongside Dr. Aphra for a brief time. His strength, his resilience, and lack of patience for any BS gives him a unique personality when it comes to Wookiees in Star Wars. And I was over the moon he appeared in the Book of Boba. I want to see him again, bring him into Dave Filoni's film as an ally of Boba Fett. Another fantastic comic series which complements the project is the Phantom Menace comics, and it's not limited to just the comics surrounding Episode 1, it's the stories built around some of those characters, the Darth Maul run for example, or Age of the Republic Qui-Gon Jinn, telling a story that connects the audience to the Jedi before his demise. And in the case of Maul, we get some insight into his relationship with the Emperor, which adds to his tragedy when he was just discarded, and it adds some oomph, some emphasis to his anger, after he survives in the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. You kind of see the genesis of the trust he put into Palpatine. It's such a shame no more of these stories were adapted into live action, and not just the Disney ones, the ones from back in the day like the Dark Horse comics. There is some great storytelling there. 
Share your thoughts in the comments down below what is your favourite Star Wars comic. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next one. May the Force be with you, always.